Hi, everyone. Welcome to our DEI in 2020 webinar. I'm Daphne Chan, Content Manager for Orange Grove Consulting. Just a quick housekeeping detail today. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box on the bottom and we'll get to it at the end. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Heather Jean. Uh, I, I'm senior client partner here at Orange Grove, and I'm joined here today with my wonderful colleagues, Dodi Dutjen, our managing partner and fearless leader, and Sabrina Smith, our senior facilitator and consultant. So we're bringing, we're bringing you together today to talk about some of the trends and topics that we have seen in the field and anticipate are coming and are of great importance for your DEI strategies of 2022. As you know, our work focuses on operationalizing inclusion, which means we work with organizations and senior leaders on training, assessments, research, special initiatives in order to create a more inclusive culture and really maximize the value of talent. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, I think we'll, we'll dive in. Um, so Jody, why don't you kick us off? We all know that COVID-19 has been a huge disruption, um, both personally and professionally. So as we anticipate a new year coming, 2022, how do you see the after effects of COVID and kind of this new workplace playing out in relation to diversity, equity, and inclusion? I think it's really interesting because when you look at what's happening, you first off, after the, the Delta variant, a lot of organizations pushed off the opening of their offices into the new year. So in January, there's a lot of noise. Oh, my, my office wants everybody to come back. And I think the thing that we have to realize is that we have this opportunity that COVID gave us to actually rethink work and to rethink and work in a way that enables people to have more autonomy and flexibility in how they get the work done. And we know through plenty of research that when people have the choice to get the work done the way they want, they are actually more productive and they're happier and they stick around longer. And we all were talking about the great resignation and how difficult it is to hire. Well, one of the best ways to hire is to say we have flexibility. And the problem is, is what a lot of organizations are doing is a very blunt tool approach. So what I think is happening, going to continue to happen in 2022, is that more and more organizations are going to start to realize the potential of rethinking work. For, uh, for us, rethinking work really happens at the team level. What does the team need to do and finish and accomplish? And how's the best What's the best way for them to do that, to work together? And so when you define it at the team level, then the team decides and it becomes much more flexible. Now, this does not mean you still don't have business needs to be met. You know, if you've got customer facing work, then clearly you have to be there and present for the customer. But that's but it's not a either or binary switch, which I think a lot of organizations are still thinking about. So I say 2022, think flex and be creative. Incredible opportunity. Nice. Nice. And if I had to add to that, Jody, I think what I heard you say at the heart of that is about deconstructing how we see the workplace, right? This hybrid model, this remote, remote work. A lot of times, just like you said, we came back and now we're saying one day, two day, three ways. But I don't think we've stepped back enough to really deconstruct. What does it really look like? What's the most important work? What positions can be done from the workplace? And as individuals, they're starting to kind of get some footing around this for themselves, right? You talk about the great exodus. That's because they're starting to say, hey, wait a minute. I really want to have this sort of interdependency between work and life. And what that looks like for me is finding meaningful work where I feel that I can still accomplish things at the workplace and yet still have my personal okay. life at the same time. So I think it's really about helping people not be afraid to lean into those uncomfortable places, giving them the tool sets to learn how I need to show up, but also being able to ensure that we make certain that they're aware that we support the fact that work isn't the way it used to be and we look for solutions together. I think from there, people are going to start to recognize that this this model, wherever we end up landing, right, this hybrid yeah. model, remote remote model, is going to really help us as an organization to empower people and the company at the same time. So I think it's really important that we don't get stuck. That we're in a great movement. It was uncomfortable, but I think this yeah. is a great place for us to be. Yeah. Great insight, Sabrina. And just to extend on that, I do think there have been a lot of wake up calls, right? We're sort of living in this time of post social movement, um, the incredible power of Black Lives Matter, the post horrible tragedy of George, George Floyd's um, death. And a lot of organizations responded to that by coming out with diversity, equity, and inclusion statements and starting to set the scene to create strategies. 
So what do you think 2022 is going to bring? Well, first off, I think what we're starting to see a shift is, you know, 2021 was definitely all about the statement and to, to a lesser extent, all about giving everybody, you know, unconscious bias training, which is all fine because what it does is it gives, it gives a baseline. It says, here's what we're looking at and here's the vocabulary. But we know from our work that it doesn't actually really stick until we start to change the operations and the processes of how we work. So let's just take, for example, how promotions are done. We do a lot of assessments with organization to really assess where people are in terms of their inclusion processes. And we see in virtually all of them, promotion isn't a one-time decision. Promotion is typically, you know, a three to five year cycle where people are showcasing what they're capable of over the course of three to five years, and they get tapped on the shoulder to showcase what it is that they can do, and then they're given these opportunities. Well, those those informal taps on the shoulder are not really tracked anywhere. And there's a lot of bias built into that. Oh, that person looks just like me or acts just like me or reminds me of me, so therefore I'm going to put them in that role. And so, for example, changing that would have a significant change on who gets promoted. So what, I, what we're seeing is, is that more and more organizations are realizing, oh, we got to do more. So they're starting to move into the uncomfortable place of let's rethink our processes. I think one of the things that, that we work with our clients to do, and I think it really makes a difference, is we try to reframe it as this isn't this thing where we, you know, we're doing inclusion. It's about how do we change our processes and we'd look like we look at this like we would any other strategic initiative. So it's not like this big woohoo. It's just this is what we need to do in order to compete in the marketplace. And how do we do it? So when we reduce the heat on it a little bit, it becomes more accessible. And I think in 2022, you're going to see more and more organizations willing to take that first step. For us, what we always recommend is get the data. You know, we do a lot of business analytics around DEI. And I think setting that baseline is critical because you can see exactly where the challenges are. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it's important. And now that we have this data, right, which is something that we talk about all the time, now let's really do something about it, right? So from an unconscious bias perspective, let's stop and pause before we start to make decisions around who's going to get this position, who gets these opportunities and start to question what we're doing. But I also think it's from a, a language perspective, right? When we think about diversity, equity, inclusion today, we got to think about what we're thinking about and listen to how we speak. For example, I'm going to admit something that I never admit to people, right? We we use the term minority all the time. But, you know, I submit to you that in our organizations, when we start to talk about inclusive language and make people feel that they matter here, why don't we stop, you know, calling people, you know, minorities <laughs> or the minority group? We know people are marginalized. We know people of color are out there. But how about we say things like the communities of color, right? Or let's create language where people can feel mm -hmm. or what their generations are that I matter. I mean, it's small things like that that we have to start becoming conscious of. And I think from that, it gives people this opportunity, especially since the game has changed, right? And, you know, it, it's really about the employee for the organization. And people need to know that from the interview to the position, from opportunities that they matter. And it starts with just how we speak. So really being conscious of just words that we say that really let people know, hey, listen, I hear you and you matter and we're going to do this together. So I think that really, really uh, matters. And if I had to say one more thing too, we need to stay away from this whole word, these fits, right? We're looking for cultural fits. I think when we think about this from a DEI space, that word fit almost means that I have to transform or conform yes. As opposed to looking for people who bring with them talents and skills, and together we build a culture of inclusivity. So just things like that that I think we're we're not aware of that creates exclusion by you know individuals. And and let me just jump in here real quick, Heather Jean, because I want to build on what um, Sabrina is saying. Because I think there's a real link here with the with the hybrid workplace, right? So if we talk about the hybrid workplace creating more opportunity for individuals and teams to make these decisions, this idea of of respect, of making sure that people matter and giving people the autonomy to do it. It's totally together, right? It's like when we create language that's exclusive, then it's harder for people to do the job that they want. And if we're empowering them to do the job they want, I mean, it's like we need to set everybody up for success. And at the end of the day, I always, I always tell people, you know, this isn't about being politically correct. What this mm -hmm. is about is about being respectful of everybody. So we're basically saying, I matter, you matter, we all matter. That's why you're here. 
you know, yeah. the table stakes is, is that you're here. If you're here, then you're everybody, then, then you're part of the team. And, and we need to stop the high school click stuff. You know, it just doesn't work. Didn't work in high school. Doesn't work now. <laughs> Not at all. There's a, there's, a, there's a Netflix movie. I tell you, if you paid me, I couldn't tell you the name of it. But there was a <laughs> phrase that I remember that really resonates to this conversation when it comes to DEI, Jody. And they always said it's all connected. And I think that yes. when we really understand yes. that the connection starts from the system inward, upward, then what we start to do is unleash people to really show up and feel empowered and, and become supported no matter where they are in the organization to do their best work. And especially in a hybrid workplace or a, a model, remote model, where people don't necessarily get the visual, you know, the visual um, opportunities to be seen and heard, it's going to be more important that we understand that those connections have to be intentional so people can really know mm -hmm. that I do matter and I do make a difference and doesn't matter what my position is, doesn't matter what is considered, whether I'm considered marginalized and all of these things that set us apart, leadership and individuals need to start knowing that we are all connected and then we together, we hold the organization and each other accountable for building that for the organization. Mm -hmm. I think that matters. Yeah. A hundred percent. Sabrina, thank you. Authenticity, right, has been has become such an important and critical word around our work. But we know that this work isn't easy, right? <laughs> We're all sort of doing the best we can to move our culture forward and and to really create an atmosphere where, where people can show up as as themselves. Um, and something that's come up both sort of with, uh, within our own client base and also something I think that's the media is really discussing is some of the generational tensions that um, that exist in the workplace, particularly around how they view what diversity, equity, inclusion should look like. Um, and there's some tensions there. So I'm wondering if you could just address that. I think there's a couple things going on here generationally. So first off, we've got a shift generationally in how people want to work. So when you think about the organizations that are making statements, we all need to come back and you look at the people that are making those statements. It's of a certain generation, typically baby boomers or older Gen Xs. When you look at the people saying, I want to be remote. I mean, we were laughing, Daphne, we were talking about this call. I was like, Daphne, where are you? Because Daphne has been working remotely for years and she's loving it, right? And, you know, my son, who's around her age, similarly, it's just they just work wherever they want. They want the flexibility because that's what they do. And so their whole concept of work is different. And so I think what we first need to do is come to the table and challenge the assumptions mm -hmm. and say, what are these assumptions that we're making? Now, I think it can't, it, we have to do it from all levels. We can't just say, okay, well, everybody's going to be like Gen Z. We have to say, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? I like to call it like an and. So I was talking to a leader the other day, and this leader was struggling because one of um, their employees wanted a lot more flexibility than they wanted to give. And so what needs to happen is a negotiation at the table. You need to bring both sides to the table and say, OK, this is what this person wants and this is what the company wants. How do we make both needs get met? And that's where the solution comes. It can't be, let's go over to this side or let's go over to this side. It's got to be this. If you really want the opportunity, it's got to be this negotiation space, which allows us to design things. It also means that things aren't going to be, it's not going to be as rule-based or as policy-based as it was historically. And this is why measurement is so important. You know, you hear us here at Orange Grove all the time saying measure, 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 because if you're going to have a little bit more fluidity in how people work, then you've got to measure outcomes and, and what impacts a lot more clearly. So I think what's going to happen in 2022 is you're going to see even more emphasis placed on measurement because that's how you figure out what's going on. Historically, it was butts and seats. What can I see? That mm -hmm. never worked but it felt made people feel good. Now it's gonna be about what is the outcome and how do we measure the outcome? And also what was the process to get to that outcome and what was the differential impact of that process on different dem demographic groups and their experience of that. So what we're gonna get down to is more of the nuance in 2022. Yeah. I think that's spot on, Jody. And I think it's also important that we and to go back to the people, right? It's an old phrase that was stated a lot, I think, in the 70s, but the power to the people, right? And so it really is about helping people understand that they really do matter. It's about asking them questions, checking in with them. What's working for you? What's not working for you? You know, what do you think would be useful to help us as an organization? It's about giving people opportunities at various levels of the company to learn skills, apply those skills, and share feedback. At the end of 
of the day, we cannot do work business as usual because there is no more business as usual. And so it's going to be interconnected conversations between people at various levels of the organization, giving people opportunities to have a say. So again, I, I know that we have to make certain decisions and not every you know 1,000 employees will say yes to it. But I think it's really important to just staying connected and, and challenging ourselves from a leadership position to say, am I making this decision because we have to do it this way? Or am I making a decision because it honestly is or is not supporting our ability to meet our goals as an organization? So I think really okay. it's going to come down to thinking about how we develop our talent, giving them a voice in that process and making certain that we have systems that, I, you know, if, if it was perfect, a perfect world, but systems that don't keep putting us in a corner that keeps backing us up into these places where we think this is the only way to do it. And have yeah. more of a possibility thinking, I think, would be very helpful in these spaces. And I love the way you frame that as the possibility thinking, because I think that's been part of the problem when you see a lot of what's been happening, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the work we do in organizations, we get a lot of resistance from people who are like, why are we talking about this? This, you know, what, what, we only hire the best and brightest. And it's like, the problem is, is that when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, people don't mm -hmm. hire the best and brightest. They hire those people who they assume the best and brightest comes from this school, or they assume mm -hmm. the best and brightest has this characteristic and this characteristic. And a lot of people don't realize that, for example, when you're in the middle of a hiring process and you have a diverse candidate, all of a sudden, certain mm -hmm. they change the criteria in the middle of the of the hiring process so to fit the person that they want to hire. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's nuanced, right? So I'm hoping that 2022 is going to be all about the year of the nuance because that's where the problem lies. The percentage of people that are out there, you know, being overtly you know, harassing or or you know, whatever is you want to put there. And in the workplace, it's very small. Mm -hmm. The nuance, the, the, the subtle impact is happening all over the place. So let's call 2022 the year of nuance. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to push this too much, but there's something that came to me really quickly. Now I'll, I'll turn it back over, Heather Jean. But when you were talking, Jody, here's what came to my mind. Organizations say they want to hire the best and the brightest, but there's a whole bunch of light bulbs that we just haven't turned on. Right. And so I just think that we have to look at it that way. What missed opportunities or folks are we missing to really harness what's on the inside of them? We're not turning on those lights. We're, we're, we're assuming that those lights don't have the same value. And in fact, we just don't even turn them on. So I just I just wanted to share that you really brought that out when you made that comment. So we do have to shift how we see our talent in the workplace. Sabrina and her brilliant metaphors. Um, <laughs> And you know, this has been a big focus of our work this this past year, right? Is working with our clients, working with organizations around how to how to change, how to really examine and change their hiring strategies. And so mm -hmm. just to make this even more complex, now we're entering into a very interesting time where there's this talent shortage happening, right? And so how is this changing the game? How, Jody and Sabrina, how do you think this will intensify or change our work this year as well? And what should people be thinking about? Well, first off, when you think about the talent shortage, clearly this is about make becoming an employer of choice. And so, you, again, we can bring in the, the hybrid workplace because the two things that people are looking for the most is they're looking for a hybrid workplace with flexibility and they're looking for diversity. Mm -hmm. They don't want to go into an old school organization that's going to make me work, you know, 50 hours a week with a bunch of people that all look the same. They don't want it. So they're not going to go there. And, you know, I don't know how long this hiring thing will last, but in the short term, I think it's going to be something that the only way you're going to be able to hire is to showcase this differential in, in who you are. Now, what does this actually mean on the ground? What this means on the ground, and, and I said, you know, how long will this craziness with the hiring last? It may not last, you know, maybe it'll last a year or two. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the push for hybrid, the push for diversity is a long term trend. Neither one of these trends are going to go away in a year. This is the way the workplace is moving towards. So the way I always like to describe it is, is that, you know, there's a spectrum of change. Just like when you talk about, you know, product adoption curve, right? Everybody mm -hmm. should know that from business school. If you went to business school, there's the early adopters and then there's the late adopters. The late adopters are going to be stuck with the leftovers on talent. There's no doubt in my mind. The early adopters are already getting the best talent. So mm -hmm. it's this middle group. You have to decide, are you going to be on the front end or are you going to be on the back end? The longer you wait, the longer you wait to do inclusion, because it's, it's not a 
go send everybody to unconscious bias training. Right. It's about looking inside your organization and rethinking. Remember what I was talking about with the strategy and think, rethinking your workplace and how you're getting processes done. That takes three years minimum. So if you don't start now, you are now three years plus however long you wait behind. And that talent is not coming to you. So best and brightest, you're not getting them. Don't even think about it because you are behind the eight ball. So I think it's about time to jump ahead of the eight ball and start competing because there's a lot of people like, oh, I'm not so sure. So we're telling you the path forward is to figure out your challenges and start changing those processes. Yeah. And I don't want to sound like a broken record, but people are recognizing their value in the power of choice. And so like Jody said, you know, if you're not reacting as an organization now and understanding where your blind spots are and being open to seeing, you are going to miss out. You are going to be left behind. But I also think on a very practical level, it's really important that we think about several other things, right? So I'm all for education. Okay. But I'm going to say, this right so we have job positions where we say you have to have a master's degree and you have to have all these other qualifications when you know i've talked to many people in the hr space they don't even hire for all of that but they exclude people with those job descriptions right so from an inclusivity perspective we know that we're not looking for 100 fit so we need to get rid of that language right and also be open to the fact that maybe a person with a bachelor's in experience is just as important right so we're not saying people with masters don't get hired what we're saying is let's not paint ourselves in a picture that we're missing great talent. But I also think that from a practical level, if we really want to create inclusion is there's a lot of people that may not have some of the educational achievements yet, right? But they are emotionally intelligent. And and absolutely, there are so many leaders who have the skills fit. And that's what we're looking for in job interviews. But from a diversity, equity, and inclusion, we may have people with more practical leadership experience and emotional intelligence that we can teach skills to. So I think we just have to take the lids off of, you know, what is the perfect candidate because there isn't and look for candidates with potential. People that are willing to learn interviews that help us to see your ability to manage your emotions and recognize the emotions of other people, as opposed to just this is the skill you have. We've got to balance how we're seeing that because in 2022, um, if we're just going to think we're just going to keep getting all the folks who graduated from Harvard, you know, who's who bring with them MIT skill sets to run our companies, we're still going to be exclusive and we're going to miss great talent in our doors, or we're running them out of the doors because we don't know how to manage that. So we really do have to take a look at from a DEI space, how we are allowing people opportunities who may not come to the table with the old school, uh, you know, assessment of skill sets to actually have an opportunity. So we just need to rethink that. Mm. That's great. Thank you, Sabrina. And, And I think I just want to make sure we touch upon the concept of resistance, because we know that organizational change always brings resistance. And it's something that we work with. We coach our clients, we see in the field consistently, it's sort of, it is part of this work. Um, And so Jody and Sabrina, I'm hoping you could just kind of touch upon what what we're anticipating around resistance as, as this process plays out in the coming year. Yeah, so I think resistance is, the way that you know change is happening is that you see resistance. Mm -hmm. So one of the best things I've ever heard was that when you can look at resistance as a positive signal, right? It's a message. It's a, it's a, it's a story that people are telling. And so you can tell, and all resistance is, is fear, right? We call it resistance with this fancy word, but at the end of the day, it's fear. So if people are coming to us with fear, then what we need to do is really listen to why they're afraid. Mm -hmm. What are they afraid of? Maybe they're afraid of, I don't have a place in the way you're talking in this new organization. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm lost. I don't know what to say. And then once you get people to actually be a little vulnerable about their fear, you can (laughs) actually address it. It can be a skill set. It can be about a conversation. It can be about listening and understanding. And then the beautiful thing, you know, there is no growth without pain. I always like to tell the story like when you when you have um, a child that goes through adolescence, it's actually physically painful. Like one of my sons had like painful growth pains. He could not become an adult until he went through those pains. Well, this is exactly what we're doing. We're going through these growth pains from organizational perspective. So yes, it doesn't mean that it's pleasant, but it does mean we're growing. Mm-hmm. And so let's start to envision what we could become. And I really think it's important that inclusion does not mean we exclude, for example, white men. 
Right. What we need to do, inclusion means everybody. It means, you know, back to what you were saying, Sabrina, it means that everybody feels is valued. It, we have to start to think inclusively and say, what are we trying to create? I would hazard a guess that there's virtually nobody in, in well, maybe very, very few people in organizations that would say that they don't, that they want to devalue people. Mm -hmm. Nobody really wants to do that. They just are afraid that they themselves are going to be devalued. So let's shift how we talk about it and help bring a, a, an open conversation so we can start to listen and hear the pain that people are going through. Yeah, and I think that you said something really beautiful there, Jody, right? So this resistance coming from a place of fear. I, I, I remember just not too long ago being in a session with someone and some of the resistance to this whole conversation around inclusion and diversity and all of that for them was like, look it, I don't even know how to connect across the lines. I don't even know how to step outside of everything that I know and even do this thing. So some of that fear is, I just don't know how. And that's problematic for me. And right, which is why we, we start with those fundamental things about, you know, the unconscious bias training. We're trying to just take the lids off of the thinking. So I think we do need to recognize that that's real. But I also have talked to some other folks in some facilitation sessions. And, and I had a lady, you know, I appreciate her. I honestly did because she, she, pretty much felt that it was reverse discrimination, to tell you the truth. And so really, I think it's about really educating people that it's not giving up something, it's lifting up others. And so you're not mm. losing, what you're doing is you're gifting others the mm. same opportunities so that not only do you retain value, but you also help create value in other people. And I think if we frame that properly, it makes people feel less afraid and not that I have, because I'm a white man, now I'm the threatened one or whatever that looks like, it, it really is about, listen, I've been given opportunities. I can gift other people those same opportunities. And I think that is what's really important. So we're not giving anything up. We're actually gifting up others so that I love that. we can do a better job. That's great, Sabrina. Thank you. Oh. And I, I just also want to mention that something, a growing area of our work in this space is around coaching, right? So I think coaching senior leaders in terms of really helping them embody this change and sort of model the way, um, as well as some coaching internally with employees and teams around how some of this resistance shows up in order for them to be more effective. So that's a pretty exciting um, area of our work as well. And before we wrap up, I just want to touch on um, our analytics and how we really are honing in on measurement uh, to really empower our clients and organizations to show the impact and think about this at a strategic level. Um, Jody, do you want to just touch on that? Yeah, so what I'll just say briefly is, is that we really have done a deep dive on analytics this year. And what the beautiful thing is, is that we can actually figure out very quickly, for example, pay differentials. We can figure out velocity of pr pr promotion differentials. We can talk about how people are perceiving the organization in their own career paths. We can start to dissect some of what's happening within the HR space, within the talent management space, and really point to the areas of weakness or challenge within organizations and point to the areas of strength within organizations. So this allows you to not, because what we see a lot of in 2021, what we saw a lot of was what I call throwing spaghetti at the walls. Let's try it everything. Oh, my friend's doing this. Let's try it. Instead, yeah. what we're saying is use the data to show you where and what you need to do and focus there. Yeah. The data yeah. tells the story, right, Jody? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And to maximize the value of your resources as well, right? Yeah. To really be targeted in your strategies. Um, well, I want to thank my brilliant teammates, um, Sabrina and Jody. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today. And I will pass it over uh, to Daphne. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We would love to continue the conversation if you'd like to connect directly. And we'll be sending out an email with a link to the webinar recording as well as a PDF of our support options. So please look out for that. Thanks again for joining us. See you soon. Bye. Take care.